stand up here first and be real formal about introducing Tom, and then I'll sit down and we'll be very casual and have a conversation. But it's really my pleasure to introduce to y'all to Tom Cousins. And you will know Tom as the person who started Cousins Properties uh, way back in 1958, a company that's become one of the most successful and most respected real estate companies in America. You'll also know him as someone who's become a, a civic giant in Atlanta and in the state of Georgia. He's been on so many boards, it's hard to even pick out what to mention, but they've been as varied as business boards at Nations Bank and Shaw Industries to civic boards like Central Atlanta Progress and the High Museum. He's the motivating force behind the Georgia Research Alliance, one of the most effective uh, sort of combinations of private and public work in the state of Georgia. I have been lucky enough to know him in a couple of different ways, which I would argue are way more important than this. First of all, he's my boss. Uh, and you should know he's a great boss. He's a visionary leader who is smart enough also to let the folks that work for him just get down and do the work without micromanagement. But you also know uh, as someone when you work for him that he is there on any issue, large or small, uh, to give you help. It's the perfect combination as a boss. He's also, and this is fairly important, he's also the uh, grandfather to my children. <laughs> uh, and he's pretty darn good at that too. And in the next 30 minutes, I will not ask him about his grandchildren because that is all he will talk about. <laughs> Uh, but I also know him as, and you will get to know him if you don't already in the next 30 minutes or so, as probably the most passionate philanthropist that you'll ever want to meet. And we're going to talk about his journey through philanthropy and then focus on uh, what I would argue are two of the most innovative philanthropic projects to come out of America in the last 20 years, and that's East Lake and Purpose Built. And Tom is the genius behind both of those. So, Tom Cousins. All right, so everybody can hear? All right, so what I wanted to do, Tom, was start out talking about how you got involved in philanthropy. And did, did you grow up with any examples of philanthropy? How did it become so important to you? Uh, no, I didn't grow up with any examples. I, I was, my family was quite poor. And it was always the biggest problem every month how they were going to pay the grocery bill. But, so, but I'm sure they would have been philanthropic if they had the money. Uh, I think, uh, really, uh, Greg had told me that I'd be asked, how did I get started in it? And, and I really had to think about that because there was no magic moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, I came back from uh, the Air Force in 1954, and I was not a churchman, I was not a Christian, I was, uh, I, as I said, had grown, grown up in sort of poverty, not abject poverty, there were people worse off than we. But I knew one thing I wanted to do, I wanted to make some money. I, <laughs> you know, I had seen my friends having gold uh, uh, fraternity pins and cashmere sweaters, and I, <laughs> I was a little <laughs> envious, I don't know. But anyway, that was my objective and when uh, I went in business. Uh, but uh, it actually, it was a church, as I've thought about it. I'd have to credit. Uh, I'm, I'm not an evangelist, don't let me scare anybody, but uh, if, if, you, if you read the Old or New Testament, it's pretty clear what we're supposed to do. And it presents it in, in such a compelling way. You know, and everywhere you find it in the Old and New Testament, it's like, I guess, the most famous one is Jesus' statement, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I bet every one of you can understand that. It is, there is more blessing for the giver than even the receiver. So it's almost presented, and, and you go all through the Old and New Testament, it, you know, it talks about 
how we need to give tithe. And Ann and I got married not long after that, uh, what, 1956, early 56. And between uh, the church and I married a real, a real believer, uh, we began tithing very, very soon. And got, uh, and as you know, tithing 10%, we'd give 10% and, and, and I tried to do 10% of my time. But the further I got into it, the more I, I liked it. I mean, it was to me far more rewarding than making money was to try to help some of the needs that are so many and so obvious. But one of the first big experiences with this uh, and has had much impact on what we've done subsequently, there was a program, and I look around the room, I don't, I'm not sure any of you were alive when it was passed in 1948 with legislation called Urban Renewal. You've probably heard about it, but federal legislation to clear, they call them blighted areas or slums across America and, and move these people out of these hovels into their own homes. Now the primary purpose, unfortunately, was to clear the blighted areas and they were less concerned about relocating people, but I was involved in building over a thousand of these replacement houses. And uh, and these were people that were moved out of those from Atlanta out of what was called Buttermilk Bottom. It was an area right in downtown that now all commercial properties and where the Civic Center and so forth are located. But, I mean, it was a slum slum. And uh, Gosh, we, I, I, I was involved, incidentally, in building all those houses not to help those folks. I, I was doing it as a real estate. I mean, building these houses. And uh, we've had a little inflation since then, but they had a 75-foot lot. It was about a 1,000-square-foot house. Total price, 9750 <laughs> No down payment, no closing costs. Government loan, 40 years subsidized I mean, their monthly cost was a lot less than what they'd pay in the slumlord or where they'd been. But to me, the big thing is they own their own home. And we call a court, we didn't have to do anything. I mean, you know, just stand in line, but we didn't just build the same old house. Uh, and help, we call a court, and they were beautiful beautiful developments. Three or four years later to go out to be proud of what we accomplished and there were slums again. I can't tell you. I get emotional with anybody, I'm sorry. <clears throat> How disappointing that was. <clears throat> but I thought these people are in the cars, but you know, they can't be helped. I'm not really concerned about it anymore. But it was, um, over the years, we, we did, we did more, I, I'm very fortunate uh, in business, which honestly, people think, well, you know, you're just being humble. I'm not being humble. The key was to get our people brighter than you. And I had a lot of bright people around me and uh, had a very successful company. And I formed a foundation, I don't know the date, over 50 years ago, I guess, the original foundation, and we always gave away more than our income, <coughs> but it still outgrew, it just kept growing. I mean, it was primarily funded by stock in what was Cousins Properties, which was a public company. Uh, went public in 1962. But it would just grow faster we could give it away. Uh, All right, now I'm going to jump in so I actually have a role here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. My problem is, by the way, I've, I've gotten even longer-winded. So, so you formed Cousins Foundation, 
uh, over 50 years ago. How would you describe the kinds of philanthropy that you started out doing at that time? Okay, well, doing the things for many, many years that I'm sure all of you have done. I mean, you know, the symphony and the museum and the United Way, boys clubs, girls clubs, this program of drug, you know, rehab, everything you can imagine, all the things that we are all constantly uh, solicited for. And, and we did those things all those years, and I frankly had, it grew on me the feeling it's actually easier to make money than to give it away, to give it away effectively. And I'm sure every one of you understand that. There's so many wonderful people with so many wonderful ideas, but they can't do it. I mean, they just, you give them the money and they don't have the skill to get it done. And that was, that was always a disappointment to me. I mean, you give the money and you just not see results. Or you can give it to some of the bigger things and it's just, you know, you feel, your money is not really necessary. Somebody else is supporting it, and you don't know how to do it. But anyway, we've made a big change. I don't know, you want me to keep going? Sure. Or you to <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so you, you did things traditionally, got frustrated with it, and then, so what, what change did you make? What did you, that needs to get Is that better? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, I can hear myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what was, what was the change uh, that you made? Big change, big yeah. change. This feeling of, of uh, not just, not feel like we are getting enough done, we couldn't see the results. We, I don't know where you, you know, it's such a gradual thing you probably don't appreciate, but crime just keeps getting more and more. We moved to Atlanta, we got married, we didn't lock our doors at night. Never locked your car. I was a home builder. I never heard of a house alarm. There were, you know, we heard banks had vault alarms. But now you look what has happened over this period of time. It's been very gradual. And uh, now you have gated communities. You have every house. I mean, we turn on our alarm every night. We lock our car doors. Uh, so all we've done. All of us have done to try to, you know, help with that. It just gets worse and worse. And we finally made. Uh, I was having more time from from my business, and we made a decision. We will change our whole operation. A, we were not. We were going to basically fund the unfundable. And. B, we were going to try to get some solutions to these problems. And uh, some of our acquaintances thought we were crazy, but anyway, <laughs> how are you going to get solutions to such things that have been going on so long? But uh, we've done a number of different things in different ways, and I've been so gratified. See, there are solutions. <clears throat> We don't have to have the crime we are having. We don't even have to have the poverty we've got. And I can prove that. Now, if I can get you to listen, I will <laughs> convince you, and I don't know whether I'm putting you to sleep yet, but I can <laughs> convince you. Uh, and if you have a question, I ask you please to not hesitate. Say, Tom, I don't believe that. Show me the proof. I got the proof. I got it with me. <laughs> All right. So, so the proof became the East Lake project. So tell us well, that's how. That's the one. Yeah, that's yeah. the first one. Well, right. tell us, tell us how East Lake came. How that got started. Yeah. Well, I, I really think the initial kicker, frankly, was there was an article in the New York Times. A study had been done, and it was uh, it was a professor at Rutgers who headed this study. Uh, the whole prison system of the state of New York. They interviewed, looked into the background of everybody in jail in the, in the whole state. What, trying to find out, is there something common besides drugs and alcohol? 
<clears throat> and they were shocked to find that 74% of the people in jail had grown up in just eight neighborhoods in Manhattan. Now, I saw that and I said, my gosh, you know, we had fixed neighborhoods. We, we had turned around uh, several very bad neighborhoods in Atlanta. That, that, it can be done. So I thought, hmm, well, if they had those eight neighborhoods fixed, they could tear down all those prisons to keep building hope. I called the chief of police who I knew in Atlanta. I said, I want to send you an article. Chief, said, what is it? And I said, well, I told him what it was. He said, I don't need to send it. Everybody knows that. And I said, well, I didn't know it. But he, said, <laughs> he said, in the case of Atlanta, he said, I'll bet you there are five neighborhoods in Atlanta, the city, that provide 75% of the state prison population. To which I said, I can't imagine that. Where, where is such a place? You know, I live right here in the town. I don't know what you're going to do. <clears throat> well, he says the worst one is, uh, <laughs> is out here in an area called East Lake. It's only five miles from downtown. We call it Little Vietnam. It is so bad. I said, well, I'm going to run out there and take a look. He said, we don't go out there without two cars. <laughs> <laughs> so with escorts, I got road through there. And you wouldn't believe it, this is here in our country. Now I have to tell you something, folks. You've got similar places, every one of you. I don't care what size town. And if you have any doubt about what is happening with that, get your police department to check with everybody in your jail. Where did they grow up? Where was their home? And you're going to find out where they are. They're in those places. Those places that you don't go into because they're dangerous and, you know, you wouldn't go. And, of course, once they go, you know, a kid grows up, and that's what hit me riding through. I pretty much give it up on the, on the older folks. But riding through to see all these children out there just playing around in the dirt, and, and you'd see open on the street drug dealing. Uh, and I thought, had I grown up there, I'd be in jail too, if they could have caught me. <laughs> and I tell you what, you, I, it's so rare that anybody gets out of those places, except it, males. Almost every one of them go to, go to jail. And once they're in there, it's a revolving door. They don't learn anything. They get to serve their time. Here's $50, boy, stay out of trouble. Well, you know, who's going to hire an ex-convict? $50, how long will that last? So, back in. So, a recidivism rate, anyway. So, we just have to keep building more and more new prisons. A million kids are born each year into poverty, out of a birth rate of like four and a half or something. So we get a million new prospects unless we do something <clears throat> to just keep running those crime figures up. And, uh, well, so let me, you, you had your first trip to East Lake Meadows probably in 1993, 1994, and yeah. out of that came the entire East Lake project. And rather than having Tom and me describe it to you in words, what we'd like to do is show you pictures, uh, both before and after, of what the East Lake Project was all about. Um, and so this is just a five-minute video that, that will give you a sense of, of East Lake and, and what happened. There are millions of people throughout this country that through no fault of their own are not getting to realize their potential. They are not yet living an American dream that other millions have. And they need a helping hand because their circumstances uh, did not give them what was given to me when I was young. There's nothing more worthwhile than, than watching somebody blossom into something they never dreamed that they could be. The crime tape marked the entrance to the scene of the shootout. It was scary. It was scary. And you could see just open on the streets, drug dealing and uh, 
the center of all that was this East Lake Meadows, which was a public housing project. 80% of the children are not performing. Some 15 years ago, Tom Cousins and the East Lake Foundation started on this journey to see if there were some solutions to the problems that faced poor people who were really locked into poverty and locked into an unhealthy community. You'd see blood on the ground where there'd been a shootout. It was terrible. And the families were absolutely petrified. It was a community that was feeding on itself. You know, it's just the luck of the draw. Suppose I had been born in East Lake Meadows. I mean, these kids that are born in those cities, they had nothing to do with why they're there. They're there. They got a bad deal. If that place can be fixed, any place can be fixed. Did I know it would work when we started this thing? No, I did not. I just knew we, we had to try. Is that the same thing as this? Oh. That is a design issue already. It looks like one thing right here. And one thing. You know that there are wings missing from the side? The changes I've seen in the East Lake community are immense. I don't even know if I would be at Georgia Tech without Drew Charter School. Because I just feel like every step prior to me attending Georgia Tech was like a step that was kind of put into motion because of the education that I received at Drew. I had some friends who went on to college. Um, I've also seen some friends who just, they went the opposite road, you know? And I, I feel like if they could have been in, in an environment like Drew, I, I feel like their lives would have taken a different turn. If you could take one of the worst neighborhoods in the country at that particular time and just recreate it into just something that is just completely mind-blowing, then I feel like you could take any community and you could replicate this. There's always someone who wants that opportunity but just needs to be given the chance to pursue it. Mayors have been looking for these solutions for years. The dream is to take the East Lake model and to offer it to other communities across America. The components include mixed income housing, education from early childhood all the way through college, support services, and a lead organization, a primary organization that focuses 100% of their time and energy on knitting together um, the other three pieces. East Lake can be replicated. We can continue the great record that uh, East Lake has started. It can work in every single community where there are people who care about their city. They care about their community, where they want to give back. It's just something that needs and ought to be done. It's just too obvious. If we don't do the work as a society, as a nation, we will regret it. No matter how bad the situation is, there's a solution to really every problem. You know, there are all kinds of things in life that people don't know could be done until they see it done. And once they see it and they start believing in it, there's no power on earth that's like the power of a great idea. we all despair about and have given up hope on, and yet I've heard you talk about them as America's greatest untapped resource. What, what do you mean when you look at it through that lens? Well, I have to tell you, I feel like after 50 years, <clears throat> more than 50 years, we have struggled, <coughs> we, have, we have found this huge untapped resource. I think, now 
you go tell somebody this, they're going to think you're crazy. <laughs> now, I know that. I'm just telling you if I can just get them to listen long enough and look and see what I'm talking about. I mean, I think it is a bigger resource. It be, it's more valuable than it could be. It is more valuable if we just bring it up uh, than if we had Saudi Arabia's oil under the ground. Every time they burn a barrel of oil, it's gone forever. You you bring a child up and give them an, him or her an education, give them a chance, they're going to be law-abiding, tax-paying. They're not going to be on the welfare roll. And they're going to see if their children are not. And I'm sure you know you're all familiar with that term, cycle of poverty. This has been going on for generations. I mean, and I understand it. If I'd been born there, that's where I'd be. And then my children would have been the same way. But folks, you can change this. Uh, crucial, you know, I told you on our first experience with housing, I mean, this would not have worked if we'd just gone and built some nice new apartments. It would not have worked. It is what we call a holistic approach, and it's all it got to be all at the same time. It is a decent place to live. A key item, what was wrong with the urban renewal, we just picked people up and put them over here. The new house, we didn't change their environment. They didn't, they're still living next door with the same folks with the same ideas they are. And he's like, every other one of those apartment units is a working family. And every other one is a publicly assisted family. And it's those publicly assisted families, by the way, where the employment was practically nothing. It's now 70 some odd percent. And they're proud to be earning money. They, uh, you know, and the, the others are, are either too old to work or handicapped. So anyway, uh, to see what is possible, it just really sets you on fire. Un greatest untapped resource is all the poverty, the, the poor of America. Now, a lot of people say, well, look, they're just lazy, they're not. No, no, these children had no choice where they're born. It could have been any one of you. We all could have been born in a circumstance like that. Fortunately, we had, my parents were poor, but let me tell you, they were disciplined. They knew where we were at all the time, and I got more spankings than most anybody. Uh, but, uh, so, that, uh, you know, what is the greatest thing you can do? I'm not even asking you to use your money, which you ought to. <laughs> but uh, what you do, you do know in every one of your cities, you know that one, two, or three, or four people that can deliver on things they ask you to help fund or whatnot. You would know, you could, you could tell, uh, you could identify, the leadership is key. It's got to be, the leader has got to be, they got to be like Mike and Gideon. They got to be tough and going to stay the course because it isn't easy. But they're there in every one of your towns. Every one of your towns has got your East Lake members. And you'll make the life in your town much better <laughs> if you take this on. So, well, and as a segue to the next part of this presentation, I'll, I'll say this: I, I worked. Uh, I was lucky enough to uh, work with Tom in, uh, on the original Beast Lake project back in the '90s. And then I left and went for Shirley. Went to work with Shirley Franklin at the City of Atlanta, and. Um, during the time I was at the city, I started hearing around the family dinner table conversations about the idea of, well, we did it in Eastlake, it could be done anywhere. And I was a part of that first Eastlake project, and I thought they were crazy. And I, of course, kept my mouth shut. I was a good son-in-law. But, um, but I really thought they were crazy. Uh, and then I finished my time at the city and, and came back into the family office, and Tom had formed purpose-built communities which was a separate nonprofit whose sole mission was to take the Eastlake model 
and get it done in other places around the country. And I have been absolutely astonished that this idea of Eastlake is transferable. It's not a one-off thing. It's not a miracle. It's not unique because it can be done in other places. And one of the first places it's being replica replicated is in Birmingham. And some of our greatest partners there are the Goodriches. And I know we now have the opportunity for them to tell their story and how they've gotten involved in this effort. So.